presentation is going to be uh, present the genealogy of the, of the textbook as an educational form. And in some ways, it's meant as a, intended or developed as a bit of a parallel to um, the, the paper that I that Jan mentioned um, about about the, the history of the lecture. And um, it um, it also, uh, um, but but at the same time, it, it relies a lot actually on that that account um, because the the textbook, as I define it in, in the paper or explore it in the paper, is um, is is something that is very difficult to understand in isolation from other instructional practices, whether it's you know recitation or um, or lecturing or, or or something else. Um, so a textbook, in that sense, is is a, is, is a book that has and it can it doesn't have to be specially built for this purpose, um, um, but is something that is used for instructional purposes um, uh, in 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 a larger instructional context, typically a class or, or a course. So um, so what I do is I, I sketch out a, a brief but broad history of a textbook um, as a pedagogical form. And what, what I do, as in the case with the examination of the lecture, is I look at it uh, as a combination of both oral and visual media communications and technologies. And uh, particularly with focusing on the, the oral and the, the textual components of, of, the, of the textbook. Um, the text, a textbook, another characteristic of the textbook is, is that it, it tends to script um, instructional practices and, and uh, oral communication in the classroom in particular ways, or structure at least. And, uh, and so again, it's important to look at the textbook in connection with those, with those, with those practices and, and, their, and the way they've changed over time. So in the um, revised title of my presentation, um, I make reference to genealogy specifically in a, in a Foucauldian sense as a means of, um, to quote Foucault, Seeking events in the most unpromising places, and what we tend to feel is without history. In sentiments, love, conscience, instincts, um, in these contexts, genealogy must be something that's sensitive to their recurrence, to the recurrence of these events, not in order to trace the gradual curve of their evolution, but to isolate the different scenes where they are engaged in different roles. Um, so the the the, the form of the textbook, um, what the different scenes and events that are important to this form um, recur in the sites of the lecture hall, the school classroom, and also uh, the bourgeois family of the um, late 18th and through the 19th and, or, and later centuries. My, this genealogical investigation shows that oral, di diagrammatic, and textual forms of communication are directly relevant to the textbook, and that their operation and combination has changed not so much through technical innovation as in concert with larger cultural and epistemological developments. So the fact that there's a new technology, um, for example, uh, all of the different types of media that emerged at the end of, at the beginning of the 20th century, like uh, phonograph, radio, um, and later television, um, don't change the textbook overnight, nor did the inventions of, of, of the printing press. Um, but rather, there's a more, a, a much more slow and um, um, uh, and gradual process that takes place instead. Uh, so together, these media forms, institutions and interactions can be said to form inscriptive systems or discourse networks, as Friedrich Kittler explains. That's the second quote here. Um, different uh, networks of technologies and institutions, that Kittler says, allow a different culture to select, store, and produce relevant da data. Technologies like that of the book printing and institutions coupled to it, such as literature and the university, thus constitute a historically very powerful formation. Um, Kittler is talking here um, in a book that was significantly influenced by Foucault, particularly Foucault's The Order of Things. And the, the book is called um, Discourse Networks 1800-1900. Um, in a sense, 
um, Kittler translated some of Foucault's ideas about knowledge and its generation and circulation to, um, to an account about media technologies and their relationship to culture. Um, so to trace the, 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 t the t paths taken by this form in the late medieval and early modern, in late medieval and early modern Europe, it is important to note that the word textbook itself, at least in English, can only be applied anachronistically. Um, in this sense, text, and so we can only take the modern sense, the current sense of the word textbook, and apply it backwards um, before the word was actually used. Um, in this sense, the textbooks of the Reformation were actually textbooks before their time, as were standard texts from Christian and classical antiquity that served te a textbook-like function in university courses. So, uh, so one of the first examples of the term textbook in the English language from the um, Oxford English Dictionary is this one, uh, where a textbook in universities is described as a book by a classic author written very wide by students to give room for an interpretation dictated by the master, etc and to be inserted into the interlines. So this, so this type of writing, uh, oops, I know I have to figure out how to get back. Uh, the type of writing that you see there um, is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is in between the lines of the text. I think this is actually a printed text rather than one that's been um, written by the student as the description says. Uh, yeah, so it's written very wide rather than being produced, mass produced or printed very wide. Um, but in any case, what's what's important here is that there's there's an interaction between um, the a book, a book form, and uh, the lecture that's going on. Let me explain that just a little bit um, further. Um, so very wide, of course, refers to the fact that there's spaces between those lines. Um, in between these widely spaced lines, of course, uh, the student writes down the interpretation dictated by the master. Although these textual activities are different from any kinds that we know today, um, uh, this definition shows, for example, that um, the textbook is situated, uh, is meaningful as a textbook in the context of the lecture, and that it also uh, works through student note-taking and study practices. So the student is, is involved, it's kind of, it's, a, it's an interact, it's set up to be interactive in a particular way. Um, also, it, it's important that this historical example shows um, some characteristics that were long significant in, uh, in uh, lectures in, uh, in universities. Um, The, the words of the master or the lecturer are dictated to the students. So that's the first important point. Um, there's a dictation that's going on, um, and, and the master is likely reading uh, word for word from his own text. And the students are also likely writing all of this down, um, again, word for word. This, th these types of practices um, are, are, can be found in uh, descriptions of the Middle Age the university lecture of the Middle Ages, um, in which a master's dictation and the diligent recording work of the student um, were the key to the lecture. Indeed, without exaggerating much, it's possible to say that in the Middle Ages and in the first couple of centuries after Gutenberg, reading and lecturing were almost the same thing. So to read was to lecture, and um, in the sense that uh, reading was typically happened as reading aloud, and uh, lecturing was something that was done not off, um, uh, not off the cuff or uh, um, improvisationally, but rather based uh, on the words, based exclusively on the words in the text. So, so in the Middle Ages, um, Lectures attended by medieval students did not involve uh, interpretations typically. Instead, they involved um, just simply readings of the classical authors themselves. So, uh, and this example here is, is of those two, of the discussion 
uh, between the two students is, is from a manual on, on, um, on instruction and expectations at a university, I think, in Paris, at the University of Paris. And so the one student says to the other that, I intend to go along with you, Bartoldus, to hear these books when you are ready to satisfy this requirement to attend lectures. So it's like, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, well, we'll hear, we'll hear those books later. Um, and the, those books are the same thing as attending lectures, hearing those books. Teaching in a medieval university involved different oral exercises and associated writing. Medieval students engaged in various kinds of note-taking from oral teaching, including making minor changes to ready-made text brought into class, taking more or less sketchy replicaciones, which I think is like just basically notes, of oral teaching delivered at higher than dictation speed and copying out under dictation of the full text of a course. This is from a scholar named Anne Blair who's done some really excellent work um, recently on, um, on the management of information, of the kind of explosion of information that happened in the early modern era with the, with the invention of the printing press. I think it's called uh, Too Much to Know or Too Much Information or something. Anyways, um, She's done also work on, on note taking that sort of thing as well in, in, uh, in the medieval uh, lecture hall. So, at a time of drifting texts and vanishing manuscripts, as Elizabeth Eisenstein says, knowledge was re retrieved um, from the biblical and classical past, and with the lecture hall, prof professorial dictation and student note taking becoming the site of its preservation and reproduction. So the, the, the professor would read the text, and the students would essentially either make a copy or um, enhance an existing copy that they had with, with, with their notes and corrections. And this is in some way, this, you can see this in some ways as a, <clears throat> as a kind of human um, site of textual production and reproduction. Um, So only later, for example, by 1730, as the earlier example showed, the lecture moved away from simply being a reading of a classic author. Um, the lecturer started to mix this reading with um, readings of his own interpretation, exegesis, or, glo or glosses on a classic text. And I, I, even though the word interpretation was used in that previous um, example, I, don't think, I think it's important to distinguish it, it from the kind of notion of hermeneutic interpretation that developed around um, Schleiermacher in the, in the, 18, in the um, late 18th and early 19th centuries. Um, so the use of the textbook in children's education um, has similar pat follows similar patterns. According to Anne-Marie Chartier, um, there's a similar um, configuration of oral and written, of rote and spontaneous communication. And this is so, sort of summed up in um, her Chartier's assertion that early modern, early modern Catholic and Protestant educational practice, in this context, learning to pray and learning to read were the same thing. Um, just in the same way that um, reading and lecturing were the same in uh, university contexts. So learning to read, she explains, bore sense only in that it was useful to ensure the population's elementary religious knowledge. It didn't have any practical application. The tools for reading were no other than prayer and catechism books. In both Protestant and Catholic religions, the method of learning was the same. From texts already known by the heart, because learned orally within the family or in the church service, the teacher made children break down words by making them spell letters and pronounce the syllables. In fact, the young reader connected the signs identified in the page with the text he already knew by heart. So this configuration um, of literacy relies heavily on dictation and um, memory, but it also, at the same time, uh, uh, relies on the printing press and the, the mass reproduction of texts in the printing press, through the printing press. And this, is, this, this apparently contradictory situation um, it is relatively sim to, simple to explain, and that is that it's based on the idea that you need to have texts that are identical um, in order to, in order for this type of uh, memorization and repetition and learning to to um, actually um, make sense. 
So to be able to recite the Lord's Prayer word for word in exactly the same way um, across um, a province or a country um, required that precise reproduction in the, in, uh, in, uh, in the text. And Martin Luther, although he doesn't, although he, well, he you know, said things like the printing press is God's greatest gift to mankind and this sort of thing. But he, he's, he also says very specific things about we need to have precise texts. We need to have texts that are clear and consistent so that people, so that people who are easily you know, sort of fooled or um, engage in misunderstandings about religious doctrine can understand this stuff and have the same belief and have a consistent belief. This type, of, this type of consistency in terms of um, information, uh, verbal information, was really impossible before the printing press. And, and uh, an example of how, how it kind of operated or manifested itself um, was through an explosion of, of books on how to run your household and how to be a good father or a good mother. And the level of the level of sort of conformity, the awareness of, con of conformity and the importance of maintaining kind of these norms suddenly kind of exploded into into um, became well, became, a, became a, a significant issue not only in terms of religious doctrine but also in terms of of everyday um, everyday sort of household activities. By the way, if there's any questions at any point, do feel free to to ask. Uh, so in this context, the textbook and also notions of literacy and even reading, um, you can only really apply these things anachronistically. So the notion that we have of literacy and its importance as a right or as a, as a, as a, as a way of, as, as a the first step in becoming a productive citizen, that didn't really sort of have the same significance. Um, to be literate for much of the 15th and 16th centuries um, in Europe was simply to be able to read and recite particular prayers and a particular religious creed. At most, it was to be able to read the Bible. Um, uh, people, people were seen, the, the mind was seen as a, as a place that could receive the truth of God. It wasn't seen as, as, as uh, somehow, um, the individual wasn't seen as somehow the origin of his or her own thoughts and, and reflections. And so writing was, uh, was generally not taught. Um, the, the most that, that people could do was to sign their own names. Um, now the, the genre or the form in which prayers and creeds together with key biblical passages were brought together was known as the catechism. And um, it's in reference to a different catechism, um, the, the small catechism that Luther makes one of the first um, references or um, uses the, the term textbook in German for the first time. So he calls this, he calls this catechism a Lehrbüchlein, a small um, teaching book, I guess. Or, and uh, the teaching, as he understood it, would have been the teaching of, of Jesus and of God. Um, but it still combines these words together, teaching and, and book, um, in a way that is uh, in a way that we understand, that's used today with a different understanding. Um, as the word catechism suggests, such a book not only brings uh, doctrinal texts together, it also implies a catechetic way of structuring oral performances and memorization. Um, so again, you have this combination of, of, a, of a text in a book and also some way in which it is to be enacted and, and interacted with. Um, It is important. So, uh, so what we have in this example, for example, is a uh, uh, indication that it's the first reading, Lectio One. Mm -hmm. Is there an easy way to do this? Oh. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, so it's the first reading, and it's supposed to happen on the first Sunday of the year. Um, so, in other words, there's a there's a uh, there's a, there's a specific structure that's a specific sort of timeline and curriculum in some ways that's implied in all of this. So the question, the question is then, what is your only comfort in life and death? And then the people who were learning in whatever situation would recite this uh, answer, that I am not my own. Um, and the, the letters here uh, refer to different biblical passages. So you have a sort of a system of, of reference. 
and uh, and um, this system of reference uh, points people to further sort of proof that they can that they can find for themselves in the in the new in the new testament. So my comfort is that I am not my own, but a belong with the body and soul, both in life and death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has faith, faithfully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my Heavenly Father, etc., etc. So, um, you can see here that not only is there a... Is there a um, the, is, is there sort of a structure of question and answer that's that's um, scheduled over the course of a year? Um, you you also see that that there's a very um, direct appeal to the individual as well. So the individual um, um, through the de device of an appellation in the text is is um, is in some ways directed and formed because this is this when they say this as their answer that is in some ways the constitution of their subjectivity, um, at least from a pedagogical and instructional perspective. Um, yeah, the, another thing to note is that, is that, is the, is the different types of typography that are used and the, and the, and the relative accuracy or, or importance of visual sort of correspondence of the references and um, how this, um, this information that's kind of in the margin um, has a different status than the, the information that's in the main part of the text or up the page. Um, this rapidly reproducible visual precision remains a central feature of the textbook as we move from um, the religious and denominational focus of the Reformation to what has been called the Age of Reason. In moving from the 16th to the 17th centuries, we um, leave the wars of of the, um, the, uh, in the wake of the Reformation behind, or at least start to. We enter the age of Descartes and the beginning of Michel Foucault's classical age. As Foucault himself explains, this is an era in which knowledge is configured quite differently than in previous decades and centuries. So Foucault says, uh, it is no longer the task, this is from the, um, the order of things, it is no longer the task of knowledge to dig out the ancient word from the unknown places where it may be hidden. Its job is to now fabricate a language and to fabricate it well, so that as an instrument of analysis and combination, this language may enable things to become distinct, to preserve themselves within their own identities, to disassociate themselves or bind themselves together. So language, in other words, um, no longer sort of is something that is echoing from a distant ancient past from the ancients and from uh, God's act of creation. Um, rather, it is uh, analytic and taxonomic. It is a tool that is used to designate and dissect phenomena from uh, both the natural and human worlds and to perform logical operations on these phenomena. In this way, uh, language is a tool um, or tech, a set of techniques to arrive at the truth. So if you think about Descartes, um, I think therefore I am. Um, what you can see Descartes is doing there as, is something that's premised on this kind of power of language, right? He's saying um, he can be certain of his own existence only because he uses these few words to designate on the one hand his, his cogitation and the other hand his, be, his being. And then what he does is he links the two together um, with the therefore um, to form a kind of logical proposition. And uh, so in other words, language has this power to both designate and to, um, and to analyze um, or to work logically. And this analytic and logical power of language was put to, to, put to many other uses. Friedrich Kittler um, very briefly highlight some of the pedagogical and material implications in connection with literacy. <clears throat> so Hitler says, of the 16th century conception of language directed children towards the many languages of creation, towards the materiality and opacity of science. In other words, the attention of children and of more 
advanced students was gradually directed away from spoken and memorized words towards the materiality of a fabricated but powerfully analytic language, one that manifested a clear correspondence to nature. This redirection can be said to begin uh, in Paris in the late 16th century with Petros Ramos. Ramos described uh, a pedagogical, or developed a pedagogical te technique, or perhaps more accurately, a method for study and learning that made extensive use of diagrams and labels, specifically in the form of branching trees. Ramos believed that every subject could be ordered as a set of ramified layers or hierarchies. However, through this belief, Ramos not only invented a particular didactic method, he has been said to have invented the notion of pedagogical methods in general. In other words, Ramos was among the first to understand that something like a method could be used in learning and study and to believe that it could be applied as a way of structuring knowledge or curricular contents in, in, in any subject. So that this, this is the, these are the types of branching trees that, that he developed. Um, Rams proposed that unclear and confused arguments could be understood only by organizing all parts into an orderly progression, moving from antecedent to consequence. Ramos's method of arrangement accomplished this by organizing an argument so that the chief matter is placed at the beginning and is arranged according to whether it is simple and complex, and then is argued and brought to a, to a conclusion. The result um, of this method is actually a strange um, arrangement of opposites. Um, so this is, this is a, an example of an arrangement of these opposites that is supposed to outline the life of Cicero, who was, you know, really important in the early modern, uh, in early modern uh, Europe, 16th century Europe. And uh, so what, what, and what he's doing here is he's, he begins by um, providing, he begins, of course, with the name Cicero. And the name Cicero, and then he has like, you know, via Ciceroneus, blah, 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 or two, uh, so he has this long Latin thing here. <clears throat> and then there's this two, um, there's these two divisions. And, uh, and this is his birth, and this is his study. And then over here we have uh, his death. And uh, in between, there's a number of other subdivisions. For example, um, birth, parents, and country, and learning studies and actions. This in turn, this separation in turn leads uh, to the perhaps more sensible sounding categories of childhood, youth, mature, age, and old age. And um, he leaves old age undeveloped because the, uh, because he, because Cicero was beheaded by um, Mark Antony at the age of 63. So in other words, you have a way in which knowledge, any subject, whether it's the life of Cicero or um, the subdivisions of, um, of the areas of study and philosophy can be um, outlined in a hierarchical tree-like fashion. And um, this has been interpreted in various ways. Um, there's quite a lot of English language um, um, scholarship on Ramus, beginning with uh, Walter Hong, who, who was influenced by McLuhan. Um, and who talked about, um, who wrote, wrote for his uh, thesis a, uh, a text called, a study called Ramus and the Decay of Dialogue. And um, Ong points out that this approach to um, studying and dissecting subjects was antithetical to uh, what Ong saw as the characteristics of orality. So in the, in the Ramus account of rhetoric, and of the world of voice in which it reportedly operated, Ong says. The art has been made over by analogy with the silent word of vision. So it's been translated into a silent um, uh, visual uh, um, mapping. Ideologically, Ong says, the, wor the world of sound has yielded unwittingly but quite effectively to the world of space. I don't agree with this, um, this a description or a characterization of Ong, but um, but it is important that that he highlights how um, you know print and um, 
Ramos's method allows for this, allows for a, a particular kind of transition. Um, this so-called ideology, Ong's silent world of carefully diagrammed space and vision, was taken even further by one of Ramos's disciples, Johann Heinrich Alsted. Um, so, in his seven-volume encyclopedia, Alsted used the methods of Ramos um, to structure all of human knowledge in a range of in intricate but sprawling charts. But Alsted is not really known for um, his work on the method of Ramos, but rather for uh, being the teacher who, who was most important for John Amos, Johann Amos Comenius. Um, now, Comenius, um, who uh, was much more influential either than Ramos or um, Alsted, um, wrote a book called the Orpus Pictus, which is uh, which has been translated in languages around the world and used for centuries after its original publication in the 1650s or so. This uh, Johann Amos Comenius and his Orpus Pictus um, fits in some ways with the work of Ramos and Alsted in that it undertakes a visual ordering of the world for purposes of learning or education. It doesn't follow the same um, um, hierarchical system exactly, but uh, Comenius develops um, his own uh, ways of organizing and, and um, categorizing the world. Specifically uh, also for uh, uh, childhood readers rather than um, for use uh, by university students. Um, the rationale that informed Comenius's famous work also fits with the general episteme, uh, Foucault's notion of, of uh, knowledge or thought in a given era, uh, and, for, uh, and for Foucault's classical era. This epistemic order is underpinned by the belief that discrete signs, even in their fit fabricated materiality, could lead, through practice, to the truth. As Robert Stillman explains, in the face of disastrous religious wars in the wake of the Reformation, um, yeah, this comes up next. Uh, in the wake of the, the disastrous religious wars in the, uh, after the Reformation, Comenius recommended as a cure for civilization's ills the creation of a universal language. Quote, a language, Comenius says, that would be absolutely new, absolutely easy, absolutely rational, and brief, a pansophic language, the universal carrier of life. Such a language would be pansophic in that it would appropriately embrace all subjects and all learners. It would work by progressing from the reality of things in their God-given order and structure to the rationality and order that could be realized in words and sentences. So here he's explaining the, um, the this is in the introduction to Orbis Pictus, and these pages are from Orbis Pictus. And he says that the ground of, of my business in this book is that central objects may be rightly presented to the senses for fear that they might, may not be received. I say and I say that aloud that this is the last foundation of all the rest, because we can neither act nor speak wisely unless we first rightly understand all the things which are to be done and whereof we are to speak. So um, what Comenius is, is interested in doing is, is in using images of different things in the world. This is an example of a, of a ship. And what he would do would be to Take, the, <clears throat> take an image of the ship and number it, and provide numbers, and then explain in a text um, how, what all the numbers, uh, what parts of the ship the numbers corresponded to, and what the, the purpose of all of the corresponding um, parts were in sailing the ship. So he had, he had, um, he had a, about 150, 200 uh, different examples of things in the world that he um, that he explained and enumerated and um, um, described in this way. Um, these include things like um, you know the the work of um, of uh, like a farmer and a butcher and a, and um, you know other jobs that were common at the time. They included things like a city, um, a uh, uh, you know the water, the sun, um, the clouds, the air. Um, 
and, and, and basically trying to cover all of the phenomena that a child would encounter. Um, and that might be familiar in the world of a child. One of the things that Comenius does, though, is he begins with the example of the, of the sun. And um, although that's something that every child would, would see and would, would be able to recognize, Comenius begins with it because it, <coughs> he sees it as the embodiment of God. <coughs> so it's, in a sense, he begins with the most important thing, which is God, um, in, the, in, in this uh, world view. Any, any questions? Or? Um, so this is uh, this painting shows the um, the persistence of recitation in in uh, schooling. So this is this is a village school teacher. Um, the great thing about this painting is you can see all of the children's mouths are, are wide open. Um, you know, presumably repeating what he's also yelling out. Um, other interesting things are although there's a there's a bookshelf with some books. The teacher is the one uh, person who actually has a book in his hand and guiding the, the recitation. Um, the, on, he's pointing to something on the blackboard that's just a couple of um, uh, letters, which indicates another thing, which is the fact that um, recitation and the kind of method of catechism was applied to uh, not just to um, religious subjects, but applied to all, all kinds of subjects. So that students would, would be able to recite aloud um, the what's important about any any one subject or um, um, uh, or topic. So um, so despite the innovations of Comenius and before him of Ramus, the question and answer of oral catechism remained a central part of instruction in classrooms in Europe and also in North America at this point. Sort of enters into the picture. So the earliest classrooms were were. Um, were run as, um, as uh, through catechism, essentially, question and, question and answer. However, um, as I mentioned, over the centuries, catechism was increasingly used to teach secular topics, including grammar, spelling, and reading, rather than being reserved for just religious instruction. But this method offered a number of advantages, which included the simplicity of forms, and, uh, and this method could also accommodate the barest of schoolroom contexts and even be used by the most underqualified teachers. The teachers just needed to be able to read the basic lines in the text. Um, if the goal were memorization, as one person says, the catechetical style eliminated the need for either pedagogical knowledge or subject knowledge on the part of the teacher. The voice of the teacher and the textbook author were not only in agreement, they were exactly the same. Um, so again, here you have a... Um, a way of teaching that um, essentially sort of interpolate, creates this, forms the subject of the student or the pupil by interpolating the words of the, of the catechism. Um, you know, the, the, the student does, doesn't supply those words, but rather um, the religious catechism and also in a sense the secular uh, subject material so it just fills that empty space. <laughs> But it's with the turn from the 18th to the 19th centuries, or as Kittler understands it, with the inauguration of the Discourse Network of 1800, that the catechetical method came under strenuous critique. Also at this time, a new arrangement was seen as necessary for the reproduction, or rather the production of knowledge. Um, so um, Herder, um, sums this up very well in a, in a, a, a school talk a school, school later from 1800 and he's talking about learning in schools but remember you catechists the eternal to toing and froing from subject to predicate from predicate to subject who created you who else did he create is not really cate catechism but <clears throat> actually a kind of bodily yawning of the word it's little more than a giddy-up sound of a driver of horses. One must catechize in one's own words. One must draw one's own words out of from which that is catechized. One's own words, these and these alone, signify <coughs> one's own thoughts. These words must one must follow in order to connect one's thoughts with them. In this way, one learns in a form that is teacherly, and one teaches in a manner akin to learning. 
Or man lernt, lernt, lernend und, und lernt, lernend. So, you can't say that easily in English. But. Um, the true source of knowledge or belief, according to Hera, is neither the, the text of the catechism nor the, the, the voice or body that is reciting it. For such exercises to be authentic, they have to recur, occur, Hera says, in one's own words and, directly, and to directly signify one's own thoughts. In the voice of the teacher, the textbook uh, the voice of the teacher, the textbook author, and the student can no longer reflexively be the same and be in unison. Um, and and this, uh, there's, a, there's a change that happens um, remarkably sort of quickly or remarkably clearly um, in, uh, at the, around, right around the year 1800, where people are talking about this in terms of what students are supposed to be doing and, and pupils are supposed to, supposed to be doing in their classes, and also about what speakers in public or in universities are supposed to be doing um, when they're when they're um, when they're giving their uh, lectures or their speech, making their speeches. And I'll talk about that in just a sec. Um, by 1800, language. Um, has lost its has long lost its special status as a logical or analytic tool. Um, in the words of Foucault, language now came to, has come to be seen as one object of knowledge among others. To know language was no longer to come as close as possible to knowledge itself. It is merely to apply the, language, the methods of understanding in general to a particular domain. Um, and here, I think. I think that we're understanding, start, starting to gain a, a, a bit more of a sort of hermeneutic, personal um, um, kind of connotation. Um, the domain that I'm concerned with in this presentation is pedagogical, and to understand it, as Herder has already indicated, um, is something that is a has, is becoming a personal or individual matter. It is not um, all that different from the example of the master's interpretation of the classic author quoted above. But this interpretive activity um, is now loaded, is now seen as being the task of the student rather than the lecturer, rather than the teacher. Friedrich Kittler, and that's the case also for what Herder was saying about the catechism. Friedrich Kittler again draws out some material and instructional implications of these changes and recasts them in terms of um, textuality and morality. Because the voice is the material of language linked to the body, the discourse network of 1800 uh, that came into being in 1800 and lasted through the century has much easier time with orality. In order for signs to be comprehensible rather than simply readable, they must be endowed with the figur figurative quality of images drawn from nature. As in the phonetic method, optical signs are surrounded with the echo of maternal orality. The result is that instead of signifiers, one has signifieds that can be seen as if the text were a film. Um, as Kindler goes on to explain, this change is realized in the context of literacy instruction through the work of Pestalozzi, Frebel, and their contemporaries. So in, when, when um, Kittler is talking about um, this, uh, about language in this way. He's referring to um, he's referring to these people who wrote again in the de decade or two before 1800 and, and also after 1800. Pestalozzi, in particular, accomplishes this with his guidebooks for bourgeois mothers in the upbringing of their children. Pestalozzi wrote quasi-fictional books um, titled Leonard and Gertrude and How Gertrude Teaches Her Children. Now, Gertrude teaches her children by speaking to them, but also by enunciating the words in their oral um, form, and only afterwards by introducing children to the textual equivalents um, of these words. This verbal training occurs in conjunction with, um, the, with an, an encouragement for the young child to, to move and be mobile, and um, also with the encouragement or with the sense that um, in education, all of life should be embraced um, in a way that's very direct. So this is from an old English translation uh, 
Pestalozzi, it's especially Froebel, were very, um, um, very influential in the development of kindergartens and child, early childhood education in the US. Um, so this is what Pestalozzi says. Although Gertrude thus exerted herself to develop very early the manual dexterity of her children, she was in no haste for them to learn to read or write. She took pains to teach them how to speak. To, she took pains to teach them early how to speak, for, as she said, of what use is it for a person to be able to read and write if he cannot speak? Since reading and writing are only the uh, only artificial sorts of speech. To this end, she makes she used to make the children pronounce syllables after her in a regular succession, taking them from an old ABC book she had. This exercise in correct and distinct articulation was, however, <clears throat> only a subordinate object in her whole scheme of education, which embraced a true comprehension of life itself. So in this kind of configuration of text and speech and, and, and uh, education, knowledge comes from the mother's mouth, from spontaneous speech as a kind of sounding out. Writing is secondary if uh, not actually tertiary to these concerns. So Pestalozzi is repeating, you know, what Rousseau said uh, a long time ago about, or much much earlier about uh, about writing and um, and speech and how how uh, writing is this pale imitation of speech and speech is um, something that is in a profound sense much more uh, true and authentic and um, and real mm -hmm. that in Dara picks up on that. Um, Fichte, oh sorry. Um, however, behind the um, Pestalozzi's emphasis on original and natural maternal orality, there still lies the intention of making children competent in the artifice of reading. So even though she is trying to make them go through a process that she sees as entirely natural, this pro the end goal of this process is to um, is to actually have them engage in this artificial task of reading. In addition, she's undertaking this um, instruction um, through by being guided by textual books um, like the books of Pestalozzi. This contradiction between oral naturalness and textual artifice is a key characteristic of pedagogical media of 1800, <coughs> and is one that is consequently underscored by Kittler. I only have one page left, so. <laughs> um, so Kittler says, <clears throat> a simple and direct short circuit characterized pedagogical discourse. Educational tracts and primers written explicitly for mothers obliterated their textuality for the sake of their addressees. Books disappeared in the mother's mouth whose original self-exploratory -explor experience had been instituted by those very books. And I think Kittler's pointing out an important relationship between speech and writing in, in, in education in general, and that is that, um, is that speech is often used as a way of disguising the artificiality of writing um, in, in various ways and forms, and the arbitrariness of, of, of written symbols. Um, a similar development in higher education um, occurred in the context of um, the lecturers in uh, Romantic uh, Germany particularly in Vienna. A similarly mediatic trick served as the basis for the apparent liberation of the lecturer's spirit from the dead letter of the text, um, as Fichte described them. Fichte himself was a powerful lecturer and public speaker. As his contemporaries noted, Fichte was able to speak freely from um, what was either the roughest notes or also from a completed um, and flowing text showing, as one contemporary observed, that, quote, what he wrote was what he inwardly spoke. And so you have this totally different sense of where language is coming from and what authenticity um, constitutes its authentic use. As William Clark explains, other speakers and professors also began to lecture on their own work without any pretense that they were glossing a text or recapitulating a tradition. Departure from an actual or even virtual textbook as the basis for lecturing constituted the ultimate break with the sermon or the medieval lecture. 
So, but, but the question is now, what does all this have to do with the textbook? Um, to answer this question, I'm going to turn again to Pestalozzi, who, uh, in addition to writing books for, that explained uh, to mothers how they should teach, also wrote about um, pedagogical methods in general. And, uh, and also and with the basic idea that, um, that children could learn through an inductive method something in which a way in which children would, would be directed towards concrete realities that were literally right in front of them and from that they would develop um, be able to proceed to understandings and generalizations that were more abstract this the introduction of this inductive method led, led to a kind of revolution in american textbooks and education um, so one historian <coughs> says that uh, this is the first book that crossed the Atlantic, um, or that shows the influence of Pestalozzi crossing the Atlantic. And it's from 1820. Um, and here's how one historian said, one historian says that this first Pestalozzian te textbook, called The First Lessons in Arithmetic, was compiled by Warren Col Colburn. This book had a tremendous influence on all arithmetic textbooks. Its main contribution was to construe mathematics as a process of observation rather than as a ciphering procedure. How many thumbs do you have on your right hand? How many do you have on your left? How many do you have on both together? That's something that a child could look at and, and understand. It's very different from Comenius' um, introduction of the sun as being, the, you know, as being kind of the equivalent of, of God. Um, and is much more sort of material and immediate and direct. By using concrete examples, for example, for instance, of grammar rules or basic geographic functions, um, this Pestalozzi method was able to lead the student to a recognition uh, of more abstract generalities. This inductive approach, as Perkins said, um, led the student away from prescribed answers to ask him or her to determine an explanation for him or herself. So the, you, you remove the, 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 the text of the catechism that forms the answer to the, to the question that's posed. And instead you have a question that's posed, and then the, the answer to that question is then the space where the subject essentially generates his or her own knowledge or response. Um, so the, question, the final question is, what does this say to us today? Now the thing that's kind of weird is that Let's see, that's the example from the Pestalozzi textbook. This is, a, this is a page from a popular North American introduction to psychology textbook. And I'm not sure whether how widespread these kind of textbooks are, are here. But um, this is very typical, and uh, this would have, this, for the students, would follow, and follow from a long succession of text, mathematics and other science textbooks that they would have been um, working with in, uh, in, in school um, before they reached their first year of university. Um, in the case of the textbook, as this image shows, we can skip fairly directly from the 1900s to our own 21st century. Now, although there were all kinds of media forms that developed, were developed and also brought into the classroom, like, the, like film and, and, uh, and uh, record, record players, these actually didn't end up um, really changing the nature of instruction all that much, or in particularly the nature of, um, of, of the textbook. Um, now, Kittler explains that, that these new, new media corresponded to, these new tech media technologies corresponded to a new understanding of the mechanics of human perception of memory. And, and uh, Kittler uses the example of Wilhelm Wundt and Ebbinghaus as, uh, as psychologists who pioneered in the, the development of ways of understanding, like literally the mechanics of vision and of, uh, of hearing, and uh, for example, the persistence of vision that um, a film requires in order for it to be visible as emotion. Um, however, despite all of this uh, change in terms of new media forms and new ways of understanding uh, the human mind and human perception. 
the textbook persists relatively unchanged. So this example of a textbook demonstrates a number of things that we can we can trace back to Khomeini, uh, to Pestalozzi and even to Khomeini's. So for example, um, you have questions, and there's no answers to these questions. So these are sort of broadly inductive kind of questions that are directed at the at the young reader and meant to sort of address him or her in, in her current in their current situation. So um, so I'll just read this out. Have you have you ever found yourself reacting to something as oops as one of your biological parents would? Perhaps in a way you vowed you never would, and then wonder how much of your personality you inherited? To what extent are person-to-person -person differences in personality predisposed by our genes? To what extent uh, are they predisposed by home and community environments? There's also a lot of use of, of um, fancy sort of typography to show the organization of the subject matter and um, of the textbook itself. And if you look at the initial paragraph here, there's something that's quite interesting in terms of how it addresses the student, very specifically in terms of sort of their position in the cosmos and their position in um, in uh, in terms of the, the sort of world of science of psychology, because they start talking about how outer space is, you know, gigantic and complex and and a multitudinous. And then the text goes on to say that this same awe-inspiring um, outer space is mirrored in our inner space, and uh, that this is this is a, it's a profound mystery as to how it works. Um, so, in other words, again, the the reader is sort of located in in a in a, in a cosmic order, um, and uh, with in 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 that way. To, Addressed in a way that's very direct and um, and um, hopefully relevant and um, evocative of, of a response by the reader. Um, of course, the language that is used to understand um, what this textbook page is doing um, is um, really quite different from the vocabulary of Pestalozzi or Comenius. Instead of the inductive questioning of the Pestalozzian method, we speak today in psychology, in educational psychology, of self-processes, um, which include processes like self-talk or self-explanation. And that's what would be seen as being evoked by these questions. Um, these self-explanations and self-talk are, are supposed to be cued through questions and other design features. And instead of um, branching, hierarchical branching trees or diagrams um, we have today in, in this textbook page as well, things like advanced organizers and or associative mind maps that are seen in various ways as mirroring um, the schemas, representations, or other structures or actions of the mind or even more literally of the brain. So the truth and knowledge that can no longer be recovered from the, the tr truth and knowledge can no longer be recovered through from the past through faithful recitation, note-taking, um, and other activities. Nor can truth and knowledge be regarded as accessible directly through language, whether this language is natural, logical, hands-offic, or natural scientific in nature. Um, epistemic value is also not found in the particular experience of original, natural, or maternal um, expressivity or oral speech. Instead, it is found at the interface of human development on the one hand um, and performance and the representation or measurement uh, of this performance through technologies and media on the other. Um, so starting with 1900, um, you have uh, development of psychology in education specifically, uh, both in Germany and in America, um, that looks at the uh, performance, perceptual, and also sort of responsive performance of humans. Um, this, this example is from Edward Thorndike, um, who's pictured here. And he measured the interaction um, of telegraphic and type, typewriter technology, and how quickly um, users were able to increase their speed using these technologies simply through practice. Um, so these examples of curves here, along with the, with 
what was happening in Germany is where our term today of the learning curve comes from, right? It's like over time, through repeated exercise, um, one, one's performance increases. Um, similar measurement and calibration continues today with um, sophisticated imaging of brain activity and also through the development of uh, human performance technologies. There's whole areas um, uh, of research uh, and, and the sort of sub-discipline that, that bears that name. In this context, the task of institutions and education, and even of the bourgeois family, is to cultivate carefully measured content-independent competencies in order to equip the learner for the ever-changing demands of global capital. Just a formative question. I couldn't follow the, your last argument. Oh, okay. you finished. Went a bit too fast for me. Can you shortly? So the link with global capital and then. So, so that what, that what your last argument was about? Yeah, mm -hmm. I follow it. Okay. Basically, it's that that we the the way that sort of the learning subject is understood today is in terms of performance, and that that this performance is understood and measured in in direct connection with um, um, tech, different types of technology that are capable of sort of creating images or, or, or tracing this performance in some way that, that we consider to be evidence. Right? So you have, you know, we know that the brain um, processes, processes, works to process language in such and such a way and that it happens more quickly and more effectively under these circumstances because we are able to put somebody's head inside of a gigantic machine that then creates an image that shows how their synapses are firing and, and connecting with one another. So that, that's sort of what I, what I was saying. Um, and that, that, you know, like an example like this and, um, shows how the, um, the, the, the sort of the mechanical and sort of objective nature of these uh, communicate, media of communication are actually really valuable for someone like Thorndike and for this way of understanding um, human learning and human performance because they can, because they provide a way of, of measuring objectively something that was, would otherwise be, um, wouldn't be quantifiable, right? So, so okay, the, 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 one of those, one of, one of these charts is for the typewriter and the other one is for the telegraph. So this, the typewriter came into being 30 years before the, the telegraph, maybe 40 or something. And but before that, how would you measure, you know, like how fast somebody's writing, right? Because there's there's you know there's, there's the writing apparatus that they're doing, and there's the or communicating um, through writing, right? There's all these things that they that they have to deal with, that, and and also the fact that they're working through the the the. Um, they're working through, they're writing through their hands. Right? Now suddenly you can say, no, writing is not an act that is, that is kind of like mediated by this, by the subjectivity of, of the body and the fluid, what's fluid handwriting. Instead, it's a mechanical process in which you um, choose between 26 different characters or 26 different combinations of dots and dashes and if anybody can sit in front of a machine and do that, either quickly or slowly, and we can measure how fast they change in terms of their speed over time. So, so the, this presupposes um, you know, uh, that the, these media of communication in the same way that the, that the you know, Luther was presupposing in his, um, his uh, attempts to you know, uh, identify what ideal learning would be like. I have a feeling I have been satisfied here. I'm <laughs> <You're> trying <laughs> to do it. Okay. So you know, because, because now you, here you are talking about measurement and mm -hmm. kind of evaluation also or, or examination. Mm -hmm. but did, it also, did it also play a role previously? Of course, not a measurement like here or like brain mm -hmm. studies, but could you mention that also earlier there was a kind of evaluation? 
used to say something about learning. Right. I don't know whether that's the case or that's why I wasn't there. You could, you could, you could think about what um, Hedda and um, is saying about catechism, and you could think about what um, Fichte is saying about about um, or demonstrated in terms of speaking. Right. And that is that is a sense of like originality, um, a sense of you know, this is. You know, how to, is implying in his complaints about the catechism that you want to hear something original from these students. You don't want to hear something that's that's repeated and that's learned verbatim. So, but but again, that's sort of just um, a sort of supposition based on. Mm -hmm. 
the same all the time. And I, I think that's forgetting something of the crypto and the distancing elements that are present in the public reading and the public writing. Right. Um, um, the th the, the, I mean, you, you did understand me correctly. Um, so let me just kind of identify a couple of things. I mean, one of the things is that um, so, so if you're if you're listening to somebody reading a, a book, um, perhaps with some gloss or something, in you know the the 15th century um, in, in a lecture, um, if 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 they were operating under current assumptions, you know about um, how you read a text, um, you know th there there were rules there were rules and, and there there were like. Maybe, so you see, you you bring into play like something like critical, right? Well, I mean, then you know if they 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 may they were likely using some a logic that would have been more scholastic, right? So so then the questions that they would be, you know, it's not as if they wouldn't be interacting with the text or, or they wouldn't have thoughts or something like that, but rather they would be thinking, okay, well, you know, um, so <coughs> this text is talking about. You know this person, this condition existing at such and such a time. How does that relate to what we know from the Bible, and how does that relate to other classical texts that we're that we're aware of? And and is there a way of of um, is there a way of, of explaining discrepancies or reconciling things that seem that don't seem to agree? There was so so th that was that was. Um, I mean, again, I'm also not an expert in these things, but that was a way of reading and understanding that that was common at that time, right? So if you think about some, some the work of like someone like Athanasius Kirchner, right, who did all these incredibly weird, you know, books and t discussions about how the how the um, how like the Noah's, Noah's Ark would have been constructed, right, down to like small details. Right. This is the this is that's the kind of logic that's that that one could see as being in play, rather than something like oh well, there's a distance between them, between the text and the and and the person who's sort of receiving it, that that could be a critical distance. I don't I don't like I don't see um, how you could use that except in a way that that is where something critical means something quite different. Yeah, I, I would say that it's. The, what, the, the way which you present it is too much about logic and understanding, mm -hmm. and too little about material form and material experience. I think there is a kind of element which is very good, which, it, which has to do, I think, with a kind of you know, bodily, mm -hmm. material experience and arrangement of things, which is not to be reduced to the understanding of the logic. Mm -hmm. So it's not a kind of so it is not in that sense, in that sense that I use critical. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you could you could turn it around, I think. I, I mean turn it around in the sense that that um, that for me to some extent, Irish, for example, is trying to, mm -hmm. to, to develop is that you that you should start from from kind of practical organization in the way in which letters and texts change when they travel from one to another. Mm -hmm. so there is always a kind of, of traveling. And, right. that, and that this traveling in itself creates distances and differences. That mm -hmm. is just not the same text that is going there and that I recite and then is recited yeah. and then is reproduced yeah. and then is reproduced. Yeah. No, it is a materiality which, which, which is going its way. And so it's and, and it's producing something uh, and not just reproducing. So. Okay. Okay. But it's uh, uh, yeah, no, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, okay. Um, you you are talking about the historical development of the textbook. So yeah. uh, uh, I would think that um, the context at which he is uh, talking about uh, would be difficult to bring in critical 
analysis of this. But then, uh, in this discussion, he had tried to take some advantages of, uh, of the method, especially that one of catechetical and something like that. Perhaps you, on the other hand, also bring the critique of what he is saying. Although the context at that time of the method of critical uh, question and answer would be consistent to the message as you had said, um, remained that way. But at certain point, you brought up some advantages of the method of critical, uh, where you, you mentioned, I think you pointed out that uh, it was advantageous because the teachers didn't need to be qualified. So um, I don't know, perhaps to fit what you say, um, disadvantage also could come in. That's yeah. what I was thinking. Um, right. Yeah, I think I, th I, th I think that um, in terms of advantages and disadvantages, it's uh, that, that, you, that you correctly identify. Um, it's important to understand them in the, in, at the, for the time. And so, you know, if you look at that, that, if you think of that picture of that guy in the classroom with all the little kids, um, and you think about how, um, how sort of primitive and unstructured that appears to be in a way, and also how, um, how, um, schooling in, in say, um, the U.S., the, the United States, would have had to de develop um, without the chance of there being, you know, universities and, and colleges for teachers to learn how to learn about teaching. Um, that this um, same kind of um, scripting and, and sort of what we call in the U.S. sort of teacher-proofed approach to instruction would, would be useful, or would be seen as being advantageous. We, we still, in the U.S., we still talk about teacher-proofing, um, you know, the curriculum, for example, and, uh, and, and, and that's seen mostly negatively, right, simply because now we, now it's a question of, of the fact that we have teachers who have training and have some expertise and, and um, want to be able to exercise some freedom. And, and a teacher-proofed curriculum like that of the uh, catechism, um, you don't have, you, that you're not allowed to, none of that freedom is really allowed. So, so you know, what was good, what, what could have been helpful in terms of establishing schools in an otherwise um, underdeveloped area um, now becomes a disadvantage when, to, you know, when um, schools are, are more commonplace and teachers have uh, educational backgrounds. Responses of people to public readings, let's say more generally, 
you know, because, um, oh, what's his name? In any case, there, there, were, there were people who, you know, who were famous for various reasons, but among those reasons would be um, the Abelard. He's a very effective public speaker, right? And people would, would be in his thrall when he would be, when he would be reading a text. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, so the question is, you know, what was going on there? What was, what, what, what could we, what could we say about that experience? You know, um, and how might that apply to 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 the lecture as, as a more kind of formal exercise? No, I was just I was just wanted to point to the fact that I mm -hmm. think should be putting it in, in terms of dictation and recitation that that is too poor to say something about what this form, mm -hmm. <laughs> this pedagogic form allows for includes more experiences than just more practices. And just this, these two that's Do you have any suggestions about how I look into that? <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps it's also about more looking at also, because I don't know whether you could also look at more active pedagogic practices going on. I mean, it's not just about lecturing and listening, but it's also about, for instance, learning by heart. Yeah. Which yeah. is also a practice. Yeah. Uh, which also I think could link up with what is actually happening there and not just learning by heart in order to know but you could also look at it as a kind of pedagogic practice that the words yes. become flesh so to speak mm -hmm. so, but then that's also I think something in between I mean, which is not irrelevant in my opinion no, no not at all, not at all. Because yeah. the, so, so the needs of the, the, the the recitation or the how do you see it? The, the, the reciting simply or repeating mm -hmm. simply simply the words. Uh, Rancière, just to mention it again, is precisely referring to these kind of practices mm -hmm. which were performed by from Nietzsche to, uh, to Moliere to whatever, mm -hmm. who did that for themselves. Yeah. Who, who copied and recopied and recited the text, the same text, again and again and again and again, mm -hmm. as a way to become attentive to something. So, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. immediately taking these practices in something different, in a kind of different program, I think that is also what Kipper is doing. I, I think so. He's, I think he's missing some of the parts of the pedagogy mm -hmm. because he is really looking at it from the standpoint of what is happening to information. Mm -hmm. That is what is So information is made available, it is copied, and he's looking at the student as a copy machine. Yeah. He uses yeah. this yeah. 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 It's, a, it's a copy machine. Yeah. Yeah. And so at the moment that the copy machine is replaced by other copy machines, it's no use anymore for the student to sit there. Yeah. But they remain, they remain there sitting, and I think there is some, something about it that is happening there that is different, that he's not catching. Yeah. In, in this kind of um, approach. Mm -hmm. and so that is what I want to say, so that there is more about it yeah, and, and looking at it from the standpoint of text as a kind of knowledge that in one way or another is transmitted or critiqued or, or so, mm -hmm. criticized. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, Okay. Just a minute. Very small thing, because we, we, we use still the term today for hoogcollege. It's a kind of, it's difficult to translate it. Hear, or a hearing. We, we oh, whether it has something also to do with differences in, in how we look at lecture. So we, 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 we do not use, uh, we, I don't think we really have a kind of translation of the word lecture. But we look at it from the side of the students and not from the side of the one who was standing in front. So, so the word for lecture um, in Dutch is something like hear for reading. Like, hear, hear together reading. 
Oh, okay. College, the co oh, college okay. to read together, yeah. but to hear it, that you, yeah. you hear the so reading side of it, <laughs> that you still the final finals, not from the side of the one who is standing in front. That also indicates a kind of difference in, yeah. in the practice of Because in the German words, Euler is always thought about or just mm -hmm. from the perspective of the speaker. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. that's not how we think. Mm -hmm. And this is yes. yes. do we use that for university? Mm -hmm. yeah. And in education, it's, it's typical non-education. Mm -hmm. Someone gives a lecture. Yeah. So it's, we are more students. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> It's also, it's also hearing and not listening. It's, it's, it's a difference. Yeah. It's a unit. Oh, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, because that is also one of the elements that, that Illich brings in, and I think Reiser brings in, that there is a difference, that there is a difference between hearing and listening, and that mm -hmm. precisely because of the hearing, it is not simply reproduced, it is not simply obedience. Right. It is not, yeah. I'm listening to you, no, I'm hearing you. And that's something different. Right. Where, where, so which text of college are you? Mm -hmm. the text are you? There are some different ones, but yeah. in the, in the list there is the text about the, uh, the first didactic book that is uh, discussing... Uh, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, vineyard yeah. Yeah. the vineyard of the text. Yeah, yeah. The vineyard of the text. The vineyard of the text and so on. That's, that's the top of my reading list, actually. <laughs> <laughs> So if we have no more comments or questions, then we thank you very much for your lecture. Your lecture or yeah. 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 Yeah.